Welcome back everyone to our study of the Acts of the Apostles. I hope you're enjoying these sessions. As you can see today, we are still in the introductory phase, chapter one, but it's a very rich chapter and I hope you're able to receive what Jeff Cavins was giving us. But I just want to point out one or two things that are maybe rich and we have to take, in, take to heart as we move forward. Uh, as you would have known up to now, Luke is a very sophisticated writer and the structure is very important. And today's first chapter, Luke reveals to us, if you're very attentive, the structure of the Acts of the Apostles, which is the opposite structure to the Gospel. The Gospel went from the ends of the earth to Judea and Samaria, and Jesus went all the way to Jerusalem and died there. And now we have, beginning in Jerusalem, then we move from Judea to Samaria, in the second part of the Acts of the Apostles, and then it will lead us to the ends of the earth with St. Paul and Peter in Rome. And in chapter 1, verse 8, this is a key line. And within this line is contained what I call the three waves of joy. So the book has a three-part structure that shows the church moving forward in like in concentric circles, expanding wider and wider. And these three waves are encapsulated in the single verse of the Acts of the Apostles, which is, Jesus promised, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So in today's session, I want to look at three key words, power, joy, and boldness, and also how the Annunciation and the event of Pentecost, like we mentioned the last time, they mirror each other and how Mary was the first to receive the Holy Spirit, and the disciples receive it in the similar way that she received it. Last week, if you remember well, we were looking at how the whole structure and writing of Luke is inviting us to the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles to be like Jesus, to become his followers, and to mirror him. But how is that possible? Well, today's verse 8 responds to this. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. How is it possible to be like Jesus? It's only possible because Jesus gives us the power to be like him. And the Greek word here for power is dunamis. Many English words come from the Greek word, like I don't know, dynamo or even more explosive, dynamite. It's a dynamic power that Jesus is going to give his followers. So both at Pentecost in the first century, but also to us through our baptism, we get the strengthening of this gift through confirmation as well. We receive a dunamis of the Lord. And what is it doing? It's shaping our soul to become more like Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Immediately in the Acts of the Apostles, the dunamis, the power of the Spirit, bring forth explosive joy. And it's that dunamis united with joy that makes these first followers of Christ so amazing. What is this joy? I like to take the definition given by Father Henry Nouwen. Joy is the inner delight of knowing I am infinitely loved by God. What is so beautiful about this principle is that joy is like a thermostat, like it remains constant, whatever the weather be. This inner joy, it's more than just a superficial joy, it's that joy in the spirit of knowing that I am infinitely loved by God. And that's the joy that these early apostles have. And it's, it's contagious, you can see it. And in chapter 8, it says it reached a fever pitch. It was an explosive joy. And it comes from this dunamis of the Spirit. So we see the disciples empowered by the dunamis of the Spirit and animated by this great joy. It gives them great boldness to proclaim the gospel in face of the most difficult challenges in life. And the word for boldness in Greek is paresia. Now, this is almost always translated in, Greek ter in English terms by boldness. And throughout the Acts of the Apostles, beginning with chapter 5, all the way to the last chapter, chapter 28, it's one of the chief characteristics, along with joy, empowered by the Spirit, the followers of Jesus Christ. And what is this paresia? Probably the best definition, the beautiful definition in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 2778, where it's a straightforward simplicity, filial trust, joyous assurance, humble boldness, the certainty of being loved. And boy, do we need this? And if we can live in this paresia, this boldness, there is no challenge we cannot face and no difficulty that we cannot endure. And there's no persecution that we cannot undergo. And so with that empowerment, with that joy and that boldness, we are like that first generations of Christians. 
Now in chapter 4, there's this amazing uh, moment, uh, I think it's verse 29, where they begin to pray together and they say, Sovereign, Sovereign Lord, look, Lord, upon these death threats and grant your servants to speak your word with boldness. So they ask for this and the walls begin to shake. There's a second, almost like a second um, Pentecost there. And they're empowered by the Spirit, filled with this joy, and they begin to speak uh, with boldness. So the second point I wanted to bring out with you after power, joy, and boldness, those three words that we have to look out for right through the Acts of the Apostles. The second point I wanted to bring out was the mirroring between the Annunciation and Pentecost, which is fascinating. Now, when you've got used to who Luke is and getting to know his style of writing and the mirroring methods that he has, you begin to see things like this, and it really enlightens uh, the situation, and like their own life as well. Now, Luke being a very careful author, uh, once we get to see this, and we're good students of his two-volume work, if you read them carefully, you'll notice this parallel between the Annunciation and the Pentecost. And he wants us to notice this, right? Because, uh, and once you see it, you, you won't forget it, okay? And the language here as well, of course, recalls the overshadowing of the glory cloud in Mount Sinai and the tabernacle. And Luke is showing, first of all, Mary is the dwelling place of God. And the same spirit that she received, this new creation, is going to come upon the disciples now and upon us, upon the church. So what Luke wants us to get from this is that Mary is the mother of Christ and she's the model for the church. And what happened to her at the Annunciation is that the Holy Spirit came upon her, overshadowed her, and she conceived Christ in her womb so that she could bring him forth to the world. Now, that means the whole church is meant to be in the spirit of Mary. It's Marian. She's the model of what the church is called and empowered to do at, um, at Pentecost. Now, where in the New Testament do we find the very first Christian evangelization, if you say it, so to be the very first Christian uh, announce of the good news, going forth to proclaim the good news. And you might think it's the apostles preaching at Pentecost, but it's not. And it's not even the earlier in the gospel when the 12 went out together and he sent out in the 70 in mission. That's not, it's not even Jesus' preaching after his baptism. The very first Christian mission going forward to announce the good news of Christ the Messiah is Mary's visit to Elizabeth. And Mary is filled with the Holy Spirit. She's filled with the Spirit to proclaim the glorious good news of the Messiah who has become present in her and to whom she will give birth. So that means that the visitation is actually the model for evangelization, the paradigmatic model. And Mary is personifying the church. She sums up in herself what the church will eventually be. She goes forth to bear witness to Christ, who has become present in the world uh, through her. And in fact, if we, play, if we pay close attention to how Luke narrates this, the Annunciation and the Visitation, we see that Luke depicts these events at the beginning of the Gospel as a preview of the beginning of the events of the Acts of the Apostles. And in fact, the Annunciation, the Visitation events are like a proto-Pentecost, a little Pentecost, the beginning of the gospel, establishing a pattern that we will see again now at Pentecost. And as the Holy Spirit made Christ present in Mary, and she brings him forth to the world, to Elizabeth, so the Holy Spirit makes Christ present in his disciples, and they will bring him forth to the world. Not obviously in a literal sense like Mary, but in a very real sense, they will proclaim the gospel. So that means that the entire church and the way we evangelize is based on this image of Mary receiving the word and bringing it to, um, to, to Elizabeth. Now, once the Holy Spirit comes upon her, notice how immediately she responds. Now that Christ is in her, she cannot keep it to herself. She has to share it. So she goes in haste to visit her cousin Elizabeth and to share the good news with her. Then... When Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, there's an explosion of joy again, an explosion of the Spirit. And Elizabeth herself is filled with the Spirit, and the infant in her womb is filled with the Spirit. And she leaps, the, the infant leaps in her womb, 
and both are filled with the Spirit. And this is like a joyful contagion of the Spirit, so to speak. And this is an image of what evangelization looks like. This is the image of what the early church looks like. And then there is this second effect. There's joy. And then with all of them, there's this overflowing of praise. Elizabeth praises Mary and the spirit-filled woman. This gives birth to the Hail Mary as well. The words of the Hail Mary here. And then Mary explodes, explodes into joy with her Magnificat and praise. So what do we learn from these beautiful texts of Luke, both in the Gospel and now in the Acts of the Apostles? We learn that before evangelization is about words. It's our acts of giving or service, whatever. It's about the presence of Jesus in us by the Holy Spirit. And when we connect with this Spirit of Jesus in us, the Holy Spirit within us, allowing the, the divine life to, to flourish in us, then it will overflow in the announce of the word. So evangelization is the fruit of an inner event. And without this inner event, our proclamations really are empty. And it follows that there can be no new evangelization without a new Pentecost, so to speak. And Mary is the model for this.